Good morning, Ottawa Bible Church. It's good to see you all here this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. If this is your first time, uh, please look at the pew in front of you. We have some yes cards. Please feel free to fill that out so we know how to contact you uh, to get to know more about you. Uh, welcome. Uh, let's stand together as we prepare to uh, sing to the Lord this morning. We are here to worship our Lord and our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, let's bow our hearts before him this morning and pray. Would you bow with me? Lord God, we come before you this morning, celebrate this life that we have in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, through the power of your spirit. Lord, we thank you for uh, the grace that you have bestowed on us, that we are living freely in that. Lord, I pray for each and every heart that's here this morning that does not know you, that is still searching, Lord, that they would find you here today. Lord, that you would be speaking. Lord, that they would hear and they would surrender their hearts to you. For all that know, know you and have surrendered, Lord, and given their lives to you fully, that you would grow us deeper in our faith and our walk with you today. We pray that as we sing, that you would hear us. Lord, that you would be pleased in what you hear and what you see as we interact as your church, a family, your sons and daughters. Be with us in fellowship and study and in song. This is the prayer of our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. My king to die Amazing love I know it's true I know it's true And it's my joy to honor you In all I do I honor you You are my king You song 
song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. When it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor. All I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. The way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Now that it is uh, January 8th, it's kind of after the holidays and back to normal life, right? A little bit. But with the new year, uh, always comes New Year's resolutions. I'm not a resolution kind of guy, but I do believe in reflecting uh, on the past year and looking forward in ways that I can improve and get better, especially in my walk with the Lord. And so it's kind of a natural time in all of our lives where a new year has come to do that. And so uh, really, I just want to kind of extend a hand and invitation. But if there's something that maybe you want to work on your prayer life, maybe there's a book of the Bible that I've never read through that book. And I would love to read through it and study it, uh, or whatever that may be. Uh, I, I, I would like to invite you just to contact myself. I know Pastor Dakota meets with tons of people as well for those same things. But we as a pastoral staff and, and elders, we want to equip you for the ministry. And the ministry isn't just going out and sharing the gospel, even though that is the main great commission to go out and reach people and to teach them. But the ministry is also your homes. How can I minister better in my home, in my marriage, in my family, in parenting? How can I minister uh, and help the people in my own church and, and bring them up and help them in discipleship and being in the word? And so maybe there's multiple areas that you're looking at and say, I could really use um, some growth in those areas. I want to improve. And so just reach out to us. We'd be glad to meet with you and to walk through those things. So I encourage you to do that. A few things. One way to get more connected just to the church body and to grow is through our home groups, which starts back up today. We send out a questions that are connected to the sermons on Sunday morning all out to our leaders and our home group attenders, and they take those questions and read them and answer them in their home groups to have deeper discussion about the sermon. So if you want to get connected, you can go to autobiblechurch.com, and you can see all of our home groups on there, the days and the times and who leads them. If you fill out a contact form on there, we will get that to that leader of that home group so they can invite you to that home group uh, coming up. So... Please check that out. It's really, really important. We have a few meetings today after church. One is for the Mexico mission trip coming up in March. 
uh, with Pastor Dakota leading that, and that'll be over in the Activity Center. It'll be about a 20-minute meeting just to touch base on details and to see where you're at uh, as a team, and so it'll be a quick meeting. And then we also have our Braves Worship meeting as that starts up uh, this week. Uh, we have the students already getting back in to campus, back into their dorm rooms. Uh, they start classes tomorrow, so please be praying for students over at Ottawa University and as we go back on campus to minister to them. We're going to be doing welcome bags tomorrow night for those uh, during dinner time at the campus. And then on the 16th, we'll be starting up regular Braves worship where we'll be doing Bible studies with the students right there on campus. And so be praying for that ministry. Uh, one more thing, we have a business meeting, our annual business meeting as the church next Sunday after this service. And so uh, that's where we do ministry reviews. Uh, we announce our budget for the year, those sort of things, the business of the church. And so come and uh, listen in on that Sunday uh, to hear more about that. And then a couple of things just in prayer. Uh, one, I want to give an update on Rhoda Martin uh, as she has uh, had some appointments this last week to do some biopsies and things uh, with the doctor. Um, she is sleeping better. They adjusted her meds. So the last couple nights she's gotten restful sleep, which is awesome, which is a praise. She has more appointments this next week on Thursday. Um, and so be, be in prayer for her and Fred uh, as they go through this journey together. Um, and pray for strength, pray for continued sleep, uh, and just in any way that you can support them. Fred and Rhoda have been uh, such a pillar here at Ottawa Bible Church in this community their whole lives. And so let's support them in this time and lift them up in prayer. Uh, we also had Mike Top with us here this morning. He's back after having uh, heart surgery. Uh, we've had Dalton, who had back surgery, was here this morning walking around. I can tell he's getting a little more, uh, he's able to walk. He's chasing the kids around, which I think is the physical therapy. Uh, but he's getting around. So we just have people. Um, we have uh, Ray and um, Sandra all right here. You're, you're here every week faithfully. And so just be in prayer for all of the people here at Auto Bible that are going through hard times or are recovering because the Lord's working. And I'm encouraged each and every week when everybody shows up and praises the Lord no matter their circumstances. And so I hope you're encouraged by that. So let's pray as Pastor Dakota comes up to give the word. Father, I thank you so much uh, for our church. Uh, Lord, you have provided, you have continued to uh, be there at every step of the way. Uh, Lord, we know you are faithful. We know that you are the truth. I thank you for your son, Jesus, and the reason we're here. Thank you for every person in this body. Um, each one of us uh, is always going through something, uh, whether it's good times or bad times, uh, suffering and trials, uh, celebrations. But in each one of those moments in our life, we would be praising your name. And we would continue to be faithful to you, Lord, in all of those times. Lord, as we listen in this morning to Pastor Dakota and what you've put on his heart, as we look at this next year, that we really look for opportunities to reach the lost. Um, that's why we're here, to reach people for you, to be obedient to you, Lord, as we live out our lives as followers of Jesus. Pray, be with us this morning, prepare our hearts for what is to be said. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? It's great to see you. Hey, we're doing a one-off, standalone sermon this morning on what our church's mission is. A church's vision statement is who you would like to become. A church's mission statement is what you would like to accomplish. And our mission statement here at Ottawa Bible Church is to make, mature, and multiply disciples for Jesus Christ. Our vision statement would be to live sent, meaning we want to be people who actively look for opportunities to be sent by the Lord. But the mission, what it is we are to be accomplishing, is to make disciples, to mature them, and then to see that they themselves multiply and create more disciples. So with that being said, uh, this morning has somewhat of a missions bent to it. And I want to begin with a story. Back in 2008, I first began doing missions with the Bob Tebow Evangelistic Association, Maybe the name Tebow sounds familiar with, uh, to you. That's Tim Tebow's father's organization. And the Tebow family has been notorious for going up and down the Philippines for the last couple of decades and reaching countless people for Christ. So I was there on my first ever trip in 2008, and I had just gotten off the plane in Manila, 
taken a cab to like some three-hour uh, site to off in the jungle, and then I found myself early in the morning standing at this this uh, torrential river just passing by. I mean, this river is not just some weak river. You can't just walk past it. In order to get to the other side and in order to get to where you want to go to be preaching, you have to go on these old ropes that look like they're 50 or 60 years old. I mean, they look like they're dwindling and they can snap at any moment. See, Bob Tebow sent me on a trip all the way up in the hills of the jungle in the Philippines to go and preach at a couple of schools. So I get there and I'm like, half awake after a 14-hour flight, and I'm just totally, everything about me is off. I'm off my sleep schedule. I don't feel right. And you know what his words were? He was like, listen, you don't have time to sleep right now because you can sleep when you get home. So he says, you go now. <laughs> and I get there, and I'm at the river, and I'm like, all right, so I'm going to walk across these ropes. I might die. Then I get to the other side, and I've got to hike up this mountain. So um, being foolish as I am, I walked all the way across the bridge, and the bridge, it's like every step I'm just like barely stepping another step because maybe I'll fall in the river, maybe I'll die, it's okay. At the, at the point in time, I was a single man, so not that many people would miss me. <laughs> I get to the other side of the river, and suddenly there's this guy there who says, and he barely knows any English, he only knows Tagalog, and he says, would you like dirt bike? Would you like dirt bike? And I'm like, yes, I'll take a dirt bike. Why not? <laughs> so he was selling uh, dirt bike rides and stuff like that. It was just a small fee. And the thing is, is he would drive it, and then I would get on the very back. And technically, there wasn't enough room for me on the back, but uh, nevertheless, that's how they do things in third world countries. So I get on the back, and we start riding up this mountain. Again, it's the first time I've ever been in the jungle of the Philippines. And I still got crusties in my eye, and I'm just sick from the flight, all sorts of stuff. And I'm placing my arms on top of his shoulders. And then, of course, he's the one steering the bike. Well, we're driving, and I'm looking at the sunrise, and I'm looking at all of the different fields and just the beauty of the jungle, and I started to notice some movement on my shoulder, and I look over at my shoulder, and I just kind of froze. I didn't know what to do. I saw a massive banana spider, yellow, purple, spots, hair, fangs the size of a dagger, whatever you want to say. I swear to this day, every time I tell the story, that banana spider gets bigger and bigger, uh, a couple of years ago, I shared the story, and it was the size of a cheeseburger. This year, I'm sharing the story, and it was the, the size of a sombrero. But <laughs> the banana spider was sitting there right on my shoulder. Apparently, we had gone through some brush, and it fell onto my shoulder, and I'm just freaking out. I didn't know it was a banana spider, but I knew it did not look safe. So I'm just sitting there frozen, and suddenly it starts to crawl down my arm. And then it crawls over my hand. And then it goes over the shoulder of the guy on, on the dirt bike who's, who's steering the bike. And then it crawls over and right into this portion of his sleeve where it opens up. It goes into his sleeve. And I'm just, I've never seen a spider like that in my life. I'm shocked. He doesn't know English. I don't know Tagalog. So I start slapping the guy's shoulder. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And he's looking at me like, you crazy American. And in the best I could with sign language, I said, spider in your shirt. So he stops the dirt bike, puts down the kickstand. We both get off, and I'm like over here like this. And this guy, like a man, just reaches in like this, and he grabs it, and I swear he looked at it, and he threw it on the ground, and then he stomped it. I'm like, what? That's, am I riding with Rambo, or what is the deal? Did Bob send me out in the middle of nowhere in the jungle? What am I doing here, right? Listen, uh, the point of the story is that through trial and tribulation, through banana spiders and all, God is a missional God who calls us to go. That is the idea. God calls us to go. And the big idea for today's sermon is of the following, an outward-facing church. An outward-facing church trusts in the empowerment of the Spirit to complete Jesus' mission. And this fits nicely with what we studied last Sunday, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit is where we came from last week. So if you weren't here last week, go back on our archives on YouTube or on our website and you can listen to that sermon. But I think this is a good transition from that standalone sermon to this one. As we start to speak about our church's mission to make, mature, and multiply, we have to remember that an outward-facing church trusts in the empowerment of the Spirit to complete His mission. 
If you would, I want to take one more moment in prayer as we dive into Acts chapter 1 this morning. Uh, you, would you just raise a hand if you feel led? You could take a knee, whatever you feel, but just take a moment of reverence with me as we dive into God's Word. God, we often at this church speak about how important it is to reach people, and we often push to live sense and to make disciples, but this morning I pray that we would also remember that it is through your good enablement, it is through the power of your Holy Spirit that that is to be accomplished. And God, as we continue to begin this new year of 2023, I I pray that we would be sensitive and would remember the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish what you have asked us to do. God, I pray for every heart in this room right now. First, uh, for all of our visitors this morning. Maybe they're coming and maybe they're trying out OBC for the first time. Or maybe um, there's people this morning listening online and they're checking us out, or they're listening faithfully, God, I just ask you to be with them. Uh, And I pray that they would be encouraged to come and experience the real thing in person where God's people gather and worship. Lord, I pray for our own church family who has been faithful to serve you here at OBC for all these years. God, I pray that we would hear this message this morning with humility in our hearts, and that we would remember what you have called us to do. Our ultimate purpose does not have discipleship as an add-on, but our ultimate purpose is to pursue making disciples. So thank you so much for the great love you have for your people. Lord, I pray for just my own tongue this morning that you would help me to be clear. Uh, Lord, through a, a bit of grogginess that you would just help me right now through the power of the Holy Spirit to even preach to your people. I thank you for making me dependent. Let us have ears that hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Acts, as many of you know, was written by Luke himself. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and Luke wrote the book of Acts. Uh, More than likely, they were written side by side, scroll by scroll. Scrolls in antiquity were about 35 feet in length. Individuals did not waste 35 length, uh, feet worth of scroll um, because they wanted to tell a lie. Individuals spent a lot of money on papyri in order to record real-life eyewitness-based events. This morning, we're going to walk through Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, but I'm going to deal with a little bit of pretext to, to give you help on context to start with. So if you will, look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Luke says this, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now we enter into our passage proper, verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth, even to the ends of the earth. Let's start with verse 6. The disciples, it'd be easy to make sport of them, wouldn't it? I mean, we read the first four Gospels, and the disciples are always those asking foolish questions that they should know. The will and the plan of God is always somewhat foggy to them. Their understanding is pretty weak, and they just don't seem to get it. 
And many a preacher can stand in a pulpit and say, see, that's exactly what we should not be like. And that would actually be proper. That would actually be true. But the disciples here for the first time, uh, maybe not the first time, but one of the first times, are finally asking a good question. Their question is this, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. We, can, we remain in Luke's writings. Luke chapter 24, I want to show you something. The gospel of Luke originally began with the story of Simeon. Do you remember Simeon? He was a man who was righteous and devout. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And the text says what? He was looking for the consolation of Israel. Then we get to the story of Anna, and we covered this during the holidays. We get to the story of Anna, the prophetess. She walks into the temple, and here's Jesus being presented. And then she starts praising God and proclaiming Jesus to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So the text of Luke's gospel begins with this searching for the Messiah, and they have a weakened understanding. Now look at Luke chapter 24, verse 13. The text of Luke's gospel ends with the continued search of the Messiah, and yet they don't all get it just yet. Verse 13, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing Jesus himself, now in resurrected form, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. There's something spiritual taking place. Verse 17, and he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? As if Jesus doesn't know, right? And they stood still looking sad. You can just picture these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're looking sad. They're looking dejected. They're, they're looking completely disappointed. And here's why. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Did you just get into your hotel overnight? Did you just unload your car, bring in your baggage, and now you're here this morning and you don't know what's happening in Jerusalem? Are you the only guy on the planet who doesn't know what's taking place in our city? Um, it would be almost like this if you were to walk into New York City on September 12th, 2001, and if somebody had asked, what in the world is going on here? A person would say, have you not heard on the, the news? Don't you know what's been taking place? The Twin Towers have fell. We've, we've gone through a terrorist attack. Something monumental has taken place in Jerusalem. These disciples are asking, do you, do you have no idea what's going on? Remember who they're speaking to. Because what's ironic is the one who is being asked that question actually does know everything that's going on. Look at verse 19. And Jesus said to them, what things? <laughs> He's being coy or something. What things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping, listen to this statement, verse 21, but we were hoping, this was our hope, this is what we desired, this is what we wanted that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Just as the book started with that hope, the book starts to conclude with that hope. Indeed, besides all this, they said, it is the third day since these things happened. It's like our hope of him coming back to life seems to be dwindling. Verse 22, but also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. Listen to what Jesus says, verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory. Don't, don't the prophecy say that the Messiah himself would also suffer for the sins of his people? Verse 27, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. 
If we were to conclude the book of Luke, the rest of the 24th chapter, we would find that Jesus makes himself known in resurrected form to the disciples, and then he speaks to them even more so about how he will eventually ascend to heaven. So coming full circle, come back with me to Acts chapter 1, look at verse 6. Why is this not a silly question for the disciples to be asking? They ask the question, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? It's not a foolish question because now they know that Jesus has died on the cross for all sin. Now they know that their real enemy was not necessarily Rome, but their real enemy was the bondage of their sin. Now they know the resurrected Jesus. Now they've met with him face to face. They've spent 40 days with him, and now they're asking the question, okay, so Jesus, what's the plan here? You've died, you've resurrected. Are you bringing the kingdom now? In other words, is this where you take over Rome? Is, is this where you establish Israel and you finish and you fulfill all the promises and covenants that you made to them that you would be their victorious king on a throne here on earth? Look at how Jesus responds to that question. Oh, for the Christian who's more focused on Jesus' return and having neglected the work of Jesus. Look at verse 7. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So let's just pause and camp out there for a moment. Jesus pretty much said to the disciples, it's better that you don't know what's coming next, and it's better that you just keep your eyes focused on the mission. Is there a time and a place for you as parents to withhold information from your children? Yeah, because if they find out too early, they'd become discouraged or they don't have the intellectual muscle at the moment to process and to really understand a given situation. There's some times where it's just better that we don't know certain things. Isn't that true? Think about it like this. The disciples asked the question, Jesus, are you now going to establish your kingdom in Jerusalem, in Israel? And he says, look, this isn't for you not to know. It's almost like Jesus is trying to save them from telling them the following. Hey, boys, uh, thanks so much for following me for the last three and a half years. Thank you so much for being faithful, but I hate to disappoint you and discourage you, but I'm actually not going to come back to earth for another 2,000 plus years. And by the way, in the midst of your lifetime, you're going to go and you're going to preach and you're going to proclaim the gospel and you're going to be a people on the move, but it's going to cost you your life. And it's likely that a lot of you are going to be kicked out of your synagogue and going to be kicked out of your family, and the way in which you are going to die is going to be a gruesome death. Yeah, how would the disciples have responded right then and there? They probably have some type of indication that persecution is coming, but what if Jesus just outright told them? What Jesus does, rather, is he says, listen, it's better for you not to know that information. It's better for you to stay focused on the mission as a motivation for my coming, which leads us into verse 8, which I think is really the bulk of today's sermon, the emphasis of today's text. Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Let's just pause there. Number one, Jesus says this. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to accomplish this work. Just as we spoke about the indwelling and the filling of the Spirit last week, so too Jesus is telling his disciples how, how, the means, the method, the way in which they're going to accomplish the Great Commission. Listen, if Matthew chapter 28 is Jesus telling the disciples what they were to go and do, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything I've taught you, if Matthew 28 was what they were supposed to do, Acts chapter 1 is the promise that these things will be accomplished. Jesus promises his Holy Spirit. Jesus promises that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the mission is going to be completed. When I was doing investigation into verse 8 this last week, I expected to find a command in verse 8. I expected in reading through the Greek that I would say, oh, there's the command. It sounds like Jesus is saying, you must go with the power of the Holy Spirit and be my witnesses to all the nations. That's what I expected to find. Did you know that verse 8 actually possesses no command? Verse 8 is in what's called the indicative mood, 
which is where one simply indicates a matter-of-fact statement that is absolutely going to happen. So here's the emphasis. Jesus is not commanding the church in this passage to go. That's another passage. In this passage, Jesus is guaranteeing the church that when the Holy Spirit comes upon him, they indeed will absolutely, factually, with absolute assurance, complete his plan. It's almost like he's saying this. I know times are going to be rough for you. I know things are going to be difficult. I know you're going to be tempted every day in this world that you live in to get your eyes off of me. But I want to remind you of my promise. My promise is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you, the church, will complete the Great Commission. In other words, if you ever doubt that the gates of hell would prevail against the kingdom of God, you need to look at this verse again and say, wait a minute, Jesus is making an absolute abundant promise that the church would complete this job because the Holy Spirit's come upon them. Which, by the way, that takes a lot of burden off our shoulders, doesn't it? I mean, for all the talk and all the reminders and all the exhortation that we do here at our church about reaching people and discipling people, that's good and that's right and that's true because we need to yield and be obedient to that task. But listen carefully. The pressure is actually not on you. You have to yield to what God is doing. But God is already willing and ready to provide the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task. I think sometimes it's unfortunate when you and I get caught in slumps or in seasons and we think to ourselves, man, I've got to do ministry in my own strength or man, these are the reasons and the excuses I have for not doing ministry, for not making disciples, for not making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. In fact, let's just review a few excuses that all of us at one point or another have made. All of us have these common excuses for why we don't reach people. Number one, well, that's not my gifting. When you declare that it's not your gifting to reach people, what you've declared is that it's a spiritual gift to accomplish the Great Commission. But brother and sister, I want to remind you that it doesn't take a spiritual gift to accomplish the Great Commission. It takes the Holy Spirit to accomplish the Great Commission, of which you may receive a gift in the midst of that to assist in the Great Commission. Fulfilling the Great Commission is not a matter of whether you have a gift or not. It's a matter of whether you have the Holy Spirit or not, number one. Number two would be this, I'm too young to reach people. You know, I'm, I'm too young, I'm still in my parents' house, I'm just going to school, I'm just doing my thing. Or maybe you're in college and you're thinking, you know, I'm just building my career and I'm just getting ready for what's next. Well, can I just tell you that there is nothing in your life that will ever matter as much as the Great Commission. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are, it doesn't matter what you think could bind you in life. If you think that your youthfulness is something that could actually be counterintuitive, I'm here to tell you that actually, if you believe in the Lord Jesus from a young age, you can still accomplish the Great Commission because God promised you would do it through the Holy Spirit. Or how about this? Let's flip it on its head. Number three would be, well, I'm just too old. You know, I'm, I'm too young to go and, and do all that. I'm, I'm too young to go on a mission trip to Mexico. I'm too young to go and reach my neighbors. I'm, or I'm too old to go and reach my neighbors. I'm too old, you know, and my, I, I've got these bodily ailments. There's nothing that I can do. Can I remind you that Moses was 80 years old when he led the people out of Egypt? Listen, if you are thinking that you are too old, I want to just fight against that lie right now. I want to tell you this. Actually, our generation needs more than ever your biblical wisdom to reach us and to love us and to help equip us and to help disciple us. If you think you're too old for the task, then you're listening to a lie from the enemy which says you can't do it. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you would be his witness. Something else I would just share is this. Maybe you would say, well, I'm just too busy, number four. I'm just too busy to accomplish the Great Commission. I'm too busy to go and to make disciples. So are you saying that your current endeavors in life take precedent over the Great Commission itself? Are you saying that all of the things that you're endeavoring to do in life are more important than yielding to the power of the Spirit to reach lost people? I want to fight against that lie and remind you of Jesus' promise. The Holy Spirit will accomplish this through you. Number five, I'm too afraid. At the end of the day, I'm just too afraid. Well, 
can I remind you that with the power of the Holy Spirit, He has not given you a spirit of fear, but He's actually given you the ability, the opportunity. He's given you the power to go and do it. How about number six? I don't know enough of the Bible. In other words, I have to reach this ultimate level of competency in the Scriptures in order to tell somebody about Jesus and to build a discipleship relationship with them. Um, can I just tell you that it doesn't matter where you're at in the ocean, whether you're just getting your feet in or whether you're diving in deep. If you know the basic bare bones of the gospel and you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you can go and you can accomplish the Great Commission. Number seven, I feel guilty. I feel guilty because for all my life I have not prioritized this. And for decades, without prioritizing it, now I feel bad that I'm finally starting to make this the number one priority in my life. Well, can I tell you that if you keep the same mindset from the past and you carry that into today and tomorrow, you will not yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of us also feel guilty because of our sinful past. You know, maybe you're a born-again believer and you're thinking about all the things you've done in the past and it's like, man, I... Because of my sin, Pastor Dakota, you don't know me. You don't know the things that I have done. Well, can I tell you that God wants you to be strong in the midst of your weakness? Can I remind you that real strength, real power, real grace comes from him and not from yourself? Or what if you're someone even right now that's wrestling with sin? Like right now in this very moment, you're not walking with Christ and you're battling with sin. Can I just tell you? It's as simple as this. Repent of your sin and get back on track with God's great commission. What about number eight? I don't want to bother people. And sometimes I can understand this. I don't want to bother people. I don't want to be awkward. But listen, what else would you want to bother them with? What else would you want to bring awkwardness to the table with than the gospel? If that awkwardness and if that bothersome nature ultimately leads a person to being saved, then isn't it worth it to bother someone or make things awkward in this one condition? I would argue so. Number nine would be this, I just don't know how to practically approach someone or to begin a relationship. Like, what do I say? I don't even know what to say. Well, Jesus is actually the one who said when the, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will teach you what you are to say. You are to go, he's going to teach you what to say. Or how about number 10? I hear this a lot, and I think it's damaging to churches, especially in our American culture. This has been the excuse for way too many generations. The excuse is, well, I'm, I'm not a pastor. That's the pastor's job. Actually, Ephesians chapter 4 says the pastor's job is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry, meaning the pastor, so to speak, gets out of the ministry to coach others how to do ministry, and then the church, all collectively together, then they, the church, go and they do the work. Listen, if the standard were to become a pastor, then those disciples in Acts chapter 1, they would have never gone and accomplished the task because some of them did become shepherds and pastors, but only after the fact of going. Listen, the excuse of I'm not a pastor or all the other reasons why you can't reach people ultimately says, I don't trust that Jesus has promised the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task in and through me and my weaknesses and my fears and my excuses take precedence over the Holy Spirit's power. None of those are good reasons or excuses. Amen? Amen? If we've got the Holy Spirit, then God can use us. Something else that I just want to say. Verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my, what? What's the word? My witnesses, which is the word martyros. Can you say martyros? Martyros was, in the beginning, a courtroom term. It was the term that was used when an individual would walk into a courtroom and he would, or she would, share an eyewitness testimony before the court of law. You witnessed a crime, you saw something happen, you give your testimony, and then you leave. That was what the term was originally meant for. And Jesus is saying, you are going to be my eyewitnesses who give testimony to what I've done in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit as you reach the nations. But see, over time, the word martyros started to morph and change and took on another meaning. The term martyros was synonymous with martyr. And here's why. Because those early Christian eyewitnesses who, 
who went and they proclaimed Jesus to people. They ended up losing their life for it. So Marturos was not only noted over time as just simply giving a testimony, but it was giving a testimony until the point of death. And at this point in verse 8, I still don't think they really get it and they really understand. But cryptically, it's like Jesus is saying, yeah, you, you're going to be my witnesses. And you're going to be my witnesses in these various locations. You're going to be my witnesses in, number one, Jerusalem, which might as well just be your hometown. The disciples would accomplish this because Acts chapter 2 all the way to Acts chapter 6 is about how they reached Jerusalem. And then Jesus says, you're going to go beyond the four walls of your own home and you're going to reach Judea and Samaria. You're going to reach the neighborhoods, the surrounding areas that are close enough to you that you actually don't want to go to. And that would be Acts chapter 6 all the way to Acts chapter 9. They would go to hostile locations that were neighboring them in Jerusalem. And then Jesus says, not only are you going to go to the neighborhoods that you don't really want to go, but you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And the rest of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9 all the way to Acts chapter 19, is all about the disciples completing that task and reaching the nations. So I think a few things for us today is we start to make application. As we make application of this very simple passage, Jesus has already promised this is going to be done through us. The first is this, is I think we can find our application in a person, in a person here in our own congregation. In fact, I think we can find application within a, a couple, a married couple in our very own congregation. When I think about a married couple who has given over very much to reach people. I think of Fred and Rhoda Martin. It's often been said that Fred was not just the youth pastor here at Ottawa Bible Church, but Fred was Ottawa's youth pastor altogether. It's often been said that, um, and I joke with Fred about this all the time, I, I speak with him sometimes, I say, brother, you're a legend around here. Because Fred and Rhoda have continuously given over their home. They've opened up their doors to others. They show the fruit of a long-term prioritization of discipleship. I have yet to meet a person, whenever Fred and Rhoda are mentioned, who don't value them and respect them very highly. And do you want to know why? It's because they love God and they love people. Um, I shared here in the pulpit a couple of months ago uh, around Thanksgiving time or so, uh, that my biological father came to visit me during Easter. And many of you heard that story of how difficult it was for me. My dad wrestles with uh, an opioid addiction, and that was very difficult when he was here on Easter Sunday and all of these things took place. And really, my whole day was wrecked, and I was hurt, and I've still wrestled with some sort of grief over that. And I'm still praying for my dad. But this is the part of the story nobody else knows. When he was going through all this stuff while he was here, it was Fred and Rhoda who said, why not allow him to come and stay at our house for three or four days and we'll take care of him and you can get back to taking care of your family. And did you know that they took in my dad for a couple of days on end? They opened the doors of their own home. They left their schedules. They left their comfort. They left everything that would have been really difficult. They left it at bay and they said, why don't you come in and and we'll feed you, and we'll talk with you, and we'll pray with you, and we'll give you the gospel. Can I tell you that if you're looking at someone who lives a lifestyle and a culture of reaching people and giving things over sacrificially for the gospel, just look at Fred and Rhoda. Then I want to ask you the question, if God has so gifted our church with such an example, have you been learning from that example? If you have gifted men and women, mature believers in Christ, who take their house key and they use it for the gospel, if you have people like that who steward what God has given them for the advancement of the gospel, how are you learning from them? Listen, discipleship and reaching the nations is more of a culture than it is a program. You and I have got to pay attention to those who are doing it right and then to follow them wholeheartedly. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, I think that's the basic idea. Something else that I just want to say today in application of this passage would be this. A healthy church is clearly on the move. Jesus lined out for us in Acts 1, 6 through 8, that the church would be on the move, that the church would receive power from his Holy Spirit, which tells me that a healthy church goes and does something and does not forget the main motivation of making disciples. 
Discipleship is not an add-on. Discipleship is the purpose. Listen, it's been said that when someone is elderly, you've heard the statement before, a body in motion, what? Stays in motion. Or maybe you can think of a shepherd who's shepherding sheep. If all a shepherd did was feed his sheep, the sheep would become greatly out of shape. And the more that a sheep is out of shape, the more that that sheep is compromised to be met with a wolf. Or what about this? This is more of a football analogy. Have you ever heard the term a holy huddle? Yes? I actually think it's good to have a holy huddle. Because what's the purpose of a huddle? If you think about a football team, a huddle is a number of men who are gathering around and the quarterback is there to call the play. And if the game is freezing cold, then at least they're there and they're warming up together before the next play. But the quarterback calls the play and then they line up on the line of scrimmage and then they execute the play. I think holy huddles are good as long as what we're doing on Sundays is here. We huddle inwardly for encouragement to hear from the word of God so that throughout the week we can then go and execute the next play. Listen very carefully. When a football team remains in their huddle for too long, what are they penalized for? They're penalized for a delay of game. And then they're penalized for five yards. And does the ball move forward or does the ball move backwards? I think the idea is that when we as churches remain inward facing and we forget about making, maturing, and multiplying disciples, what we actually do is we go backwards because that's not why Jesus purchased us with his blood. We get bored and we sit around too long. The reason we're bored is because we've neglected discipleship. God's plan for the church is to prioritize discipleship and to advance the ball down the field. And sometimes you throw a Hail Mary, sometimes you throw a post pattern, sometimes you throw a screen pass, but the goal is to keep advancing the ball down the field. Is that not true? Or what about a ship? A ship is not created to sit in its dock because algae grows on it, and then a ship becomes... Um, it, be, it, it gets filled with rust. And then suddenly, when that ship is no longer in its right condition, it can't move precious cargo, and it can't move people. It's no longer good for its purposes. It's like Jesus said, if the salt loses its saltiness, then what good is it anymore except to be trampled underfoot by men? Right? A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Listen, God's design for the church is to keep moving. And why is that? Because his spirit keeps moving. We never stay in one spot too long to be comfortable because God doesn't stay there too long. God moves us from one place to the next. And if we stay in a certain area to get comfortable, what we may be saying is, God, you keep going ahead of us, but we're going to stay right here. Listen, the purpose of God's holy huddle is for us to break and execute and come back. Call the play, break, execute, come back. A church that's on the move is a healthy church. Number two, a church that's healthy is also a church that is completely empowered by the Spirit, that doesn't look to itself, but looks to the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, you and I become extremely religious, and in our religiosity, we think that our religious effort is going to be enough to accomplish the task at hand. No, it's through the power of the Spirit, which comes through intimacy and prayer, which comes through the reading of God's Word, which comes from us congregating together. Number three would be this, is a healthy church trusts that the job is already done. A healthy church trusts that the job is already done. Jesus said this would happen and we need to trust him. The reason why we should go is because he's told us we're going to be successful. Listen, it's one thing to build a culture of making disciples at our church, but it's also necessary for us to have a certain amount of events throughout the year that would aid or assist us in this process. Maybe this is anticlimactic in nature, but let me just remind you, you have a 2023 church calendar in the bulletin that you were given in the foyer as you were coming through. And if you didn't receive one of those, you can get one in the foyer on your way out. What I want to do is just share with you a few events that we've prioritized for this coming year where you can help in the culture of making disciples. We aren't dependent on these events, but I think these encourage us to make disciples. If you look up on the screen, the first thing that I want to tell everybody about, and I'm so excited for this, is what's called our new OBC Academy. Now, I don't know where God wants to take this ministry in the long run, but for this year, this is what we're prioritizing. We're prioritizing three different events 
where the church gathers on a Saturday evening here in our activity center, and we're going to focus on two things, how you interpret the Bible correctly, and then how you use the Bible to make disciples. Number one, how do we interpret the Bible rightly? Number two, what are some practical conversational skills where I can begin a conversation, walk a person through a book of the Bible for a couple weeks on end? This is what we're going to do. In February, February 25th, we're going to have our first one on a Saturday evening, and it's going to be over the genre of the New Testament epistles. So we're going to teach you how to take a book like Ephesians and to use it as you practically disciple other people who either don't know the Lord or maybe they know the Lord, but they really need to grow. Um, number two, our event in April, April 15th, we're going to walk through the genre of Old Testament narrative. How do I take something like Judges? or Exodus, and use that to help disciple people in the faith, to grow in their understanding of the faith. And then, of course, we have in August, uh, this is a two-day event. It'll be a Friday night where we gather together, and then an all-day Saturday event, all-day Saturday. And we're going to walk through the genre of the four Gospels. My mentor, Dr. C.L. Mitchell, he came here two years ago, and he's going to be leading that one. He's going to be leading us in how we can use the Gospels to make disciples. Finally, we have a B-World training that is likely to come this year. I'm just, I have one more conversation with them to shore up our dates of when they're likely going to be coming into town. What they do is they work with church plants in Central and South America, and they use churches from America to help um, them in that endeavor, to help them in their efforts to plant those churches in Central and South America. That's our educational opportunities. We want you to prioritize it on your calendar. All of these events build so don't just say, oh, I'll go to one of them. No, like they're all going to build on top of each other, and we highly recommend that you be at all of them so that you can be better equipped to make disciples. Next would be this. We're not gonna, I'm not going to go through every one of these events, but festivals and fellowship. You know, we really love our fall festival here that we do in October, but this year we've also planned one in the spring. Um, May 20th, we're going to have a spring festival where it's likely as long as the weather is obeying the Lord, right? Uh, we're going to go and we're going to pick out a park and we're going to have a dodgeball tournament and a potluck. And if the weather doesn't permit, then we'll find a way around that. But there's a number of events on your calendar for festivals and fellowship. Please hear me. These events are not so that we can be inward facing only. Yes, a huddle should take place here to encourage one another. These events are also opportunities to bring others along or to meet the various amount of people you may or may not know here at OBC. We've been obviously growing, and if you don't know someone, then use these events as an opportunity to get to know them on a more practical level. Something else that I just want to share, not just festivals and fellowship, but next would be local outreach. You'll notice they're all color-coded in your calendar, by the way. If it's red, it stands for local outreach. I'm not going to go through all of these, but one is this year we want to have a presence at the car show. We want to be at the car show on September 16th, and we want to have a car out there. If one of you owns a really nice car and you want to, you know, be there to, you know, help uh, promote OBC, then please do it. But we're going, to, we're going to be on the streets, and we're going to have conversations with people, friendly conversations, and we're going to bring the gospel to our community. We're going to be there. Also at the rodeo and all these events, we would like to be there. We need you to help us serve. Of course, there's Awana, which is an outreach that we do. It's in purple in your calendar. And then the last thing I want to share for today is our emphasis for international missions. I pray that 10 years down the road, we're not only going to Mexico, but we're going to multiple locations. That would be amazing. But for this year, we've got a house build coming up in March. Right now, we're scheduled to have about 15 of us from the church go on that trip to Mexico, which is really good numbers. We're going to camp out in tents in Mexico. We're going to build a house for a family who's literally sleeping in a cardboard box. We're working with an organization to do that. In September, we're going back to Mexico to train pastors in Mexico to help churches, which was really fruitful last year. And then, of course, we have Operation Christmas Child. Let me just say it once more. These events are there to encourage the culture. These events themselves are not what we're depending on to make disciples. With that being said, would you please stand as we close in prayer and we close out this morning with another song in worship. God, thank you so much. Banana spiders and all, 
through the difficulties and the distractions and the temptations of this life to place our focus and our motivation and our purpose elsewhere. Despite all that, thank you so much that you have promised to empower your church to accomplish the task. Lord, help us as a church to be individuals who say, Lord, you said it, so I'll go do it. Lord, help us to be a church who doesn't have excuses, but who trusts in your Holy Spirit to do the job. Bless our fellowship. Bless our efforts to make disciples. Give us a love that you have for people. And Lord, I pray that 2023 would be fruitful because we've followed you and no one else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but holy trust in Jesus and Christ alone. seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the My anchor holds within Christ alone, cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found. Trust in his righteousness alone. While this I stand before the Christ church family just a couple of reminders before we close out today first as always i just want to remind you a healthy church stays in prayer for their church so please stay in prayer for your church second we thank you for giving in a tremendous way we're going to have our annual business meeting again next sunday the 15th where we're going to show you our plan for this coming year um we also just want to say this we've already been mentioning it but please continue to pray for our search of the third pastor whoever that person is is going to be a gift from the holy spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So please be praying for them. And then as always, if you serve here faithfully, we really are dependent on your service. So we thank you that you continue to serve. God bless you, and we will see you next Sunday. Thanks so much for today, church family. Take care. Christ alone.